Will you pray with me? God, you hold the future, and the past is behind us. Help us stay focused in the present moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When is the world going to end? Anybody have a guess? When is Jesus going to come back? People have been waiting for 2,000 years. In 1988, there was a booklet published by a man named Edgar Wisenant. And the title of that booklet was 88 Reasons Why Jesus or Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. And by rapture there, he means Jesus is coming back to collect all those who are his followers, and then everybody else, we're all facing destruction, right? So Edgar Wisenant carefully went through all the scriptures, and he could back up his argument so well that he actually said, I can only be wrong if the Bible is wrong. Well, somebody was wrong. 1988 came and went, and nothing happened. Now, it's fascinating to me because Wisenant is a, or was a retired NASA rocket engineer. He was not an unintelligent or uneducated person, and yet he still wanted to know when. Now, in our reading today, Jesus makes it super clear. Nobody knows when. Not even Jesus, not the angels. Only God knows when the end will come. Now, this section in Mark chapter 13 is called apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature is uh, obviously about the apocalypse, right? What do you think about when you hear that word apocalypse? End of the world, right? A, a big battle between good and evil that destroys everything ultimately, right? It is a type of literature. Apocalyptic literature is uh, found not only here in Mark 13, but also the book of Revelation. That's all about the apocalypse. And, and the word means to uncover or to reveal, which is why we have that title, Revelation. We also see some apocalyptic literature way back in Daniel. And this literature is not to be read literally. You wouldn't read uh, science fiction and, and believe it literally. You wouldn't read poetry literally. When we read a text like this literally, we are at the lowest level of comprehension and understanding. We're missing the depth and the richness of the text when we do that. And it gets us into trouble because then we start trying to pick dates and we wait for the stars to fall from the sky and the sun and the moon to go dark. Now, for the ancient people, it meant something different than it does for us today. They believed um, that the stars were fixed in place by God and could actually be gods or be spirits. And so when Paul talks about the, the powers of wickedness in the heavenly places, they would associate that with these stars that are falling out of their place. So when this apocalypse comes, the signs will be cosmic. Everything will be changed. The stars will lose their place, and then we'll know that the end is near. But this is actually supposed to be hopeful. Apocalyptic literature was almost always written by people who were oppressed, people who were feeling really terrible, who were suffering in their in their life and they're waiting for a time when God is going to come and save them and they are going to be on top instead of the ones who are being oppressed. And the people who are hurting them, they're gonna be destroyed. So it's not hopeful for everybody, right? Apocalyptic literature is only hopeful for the people who are oppressed. And that's what we have in our reading today. Now, the problem for us in our context is first that we tend to read it a little literally. That's why people like Edgar Wisenut are trying to figure out the date when this is going to happen. We expect it to come at some point in time, so we're watching the heavens for signs, and while we're thinking about this text, 
we're also kind of thinking about revelation and all the doomsday predictions and we mix in a little bit of Mad Max and Night of the Living Dead and all of those movies uh, Stephen King the stand all of the literature and the movies about this same topic it all gets mixed together so we expect Jesus to come riding in on the clouds like Superman and he's going to destroy everything, but first he's going to save us, we hope, right? And that's not the way this text is supposed to be read. So the first danger that we have when we read this kind of a, a reading is that we tend to take it literally while we're borrowing heavily from everything in our current day, and it ends up looking more like a movie set than the word of God. When we see Jesus like a superman, and Jesus is going to judge and destroy, we have a couple problems with that. One is, nowhere in the entire chapter 13 of Mark's gospel does Jesus judge or destroy anything. It's not in there. We add it in because we've been taught that's what's going to happen when Jesus comes again. So that's one issue. The other issue is that we forget what Jesus actually told us when he said, turn the other cheek. Where is that Jesus in that destruction story? Where's the Jesus that said, Father, forgive them? They don't know what they're doing. Where's the Jesus that said, do not judge, lest you be judged? We, we set aside all those things that Jesus told us because we're involved in this story where Jesus comes in and destroys the evildoers and saves us. Now, I know none of you in here think that, but people do. Now, there is another way that we can look at this story. Uh, according to uh, scholar and author Maurice Nichol, he doesn't see destruction here at all, which isn't in the text, by the way, and he doesn't see any judgment, but he does see something he calls birth pains. And you'll notice that if you, uh, today, when you don't have anything to do, and you sit down with Mark 13 so you can read the whole thing and relive church, you'll see that Jesus calls it birth pains also. Jesus says, when you see all this trouble in the world, it's going to happen, but it's birth pains. So Nickel holds on to that idea and notices that when the sun stops shining and the moon stops shining and the whole sky is dark, it kind of calls us back to Genesis chapter one, when there was chaos and God put the sun and the stars and the moon in place. So it's a time of rebirth. It's the end of a phase. It's the end of uh, a season. It's uh, an evolution for humanity. He doesn't see any negatives in this story at all. He only sees resurrection and rebirth, which sounds more like Jesus than destruction and judgment. No matter how you look at this text, though, people still wonder when. When is Jesus going to come back? Scholar J. Gregory Sherrill said that people have been guessing and actually picking dates from as early as the 8th century all the way to the 18th century and, of course, beyond. And he lists many of them in his scholarship. And here's a couple that I thought were interesting. Uh, in the 1800s, a man named William Miller chose the date 1843. So when the date came and went and Jesus didn't show up, and the earth kept spinning, Miller was devastated. But his followers were not. They were called the Millerites, which just makes me think of Miller Lights. But they, they were not disappointed at all. They pressed him to pick a new date, and he didn't want to do it. He couldn't understand how he could have been wrong. He was so careful in his study. But they pressured him and he finally picked October 22nd, 1844, a year later. Wrong again. The sad part of the story is that his followers, many of them had sold their homes and quit their jobs and got their affairs in order because they were so sure Jesus was coming and they wouldn't need to go back to work. There was another man named Charles Russell who also chose some dates. He chose 1874, and when nothing happened, you know, when at first you don't succeed, 
try, try again, right? So he picked another date. Uh, he picked 1914, and once again, nothing happened. Are you, are you getting the, the gist of this? You would think people would learn something by now. You'd think that they would say, okay, maybe we're going up this wrong. I mean, even Jesus said, no one knows the day. But here's what happens when you read that line literally. No one knows the day, but that doesn't mean we won't know the week or the month or the year. So they continued to choose dates. Now, Edgar, the rocket scientist, had uh, lots of company, and he did exactly the same thing. He picked 1988. He published his booklet. It, it went all over the south. I don't know if anybody saw it up here in the north. I didn't. And when it didn't happen, he just picked a new date. He picked 1989. Didn't happen again. It sounds like a bad comedy. Here's what I wanted to know. When, when I read about all of these dates this week, what happens to the people who really fully believe that Jesus is coming and the world is ending on a certain date? What happens to them when it doesn't happen? Do they just say, I made a mistake? No, they don't. There was a social scientist named Leon Festinger who in the 50s studied this phenomenon. He found a, um, a cult that believed that aliens were coming on a certain day to destroy the world. So Leon Festinger and two of his associates joined the cult so they could study it from the inside out and they went through the whole date with them and nothing happened. And they were waiting to see how the people would would understand how, how to go forward from there, right? Because when your belief is so strong, but the reality proves that you were wrong, you enter into something called cognitive dissonance. Your reality and the world don't line up. So what did people do? They didn't say, oh, I made a mistake. No, they doubled down on their beliefs they become even more fervent. They go out and proselytize to try to get as many people to believe the way that they do because what settles their cognitive dissonance is that if enough people believe the way they do, it doesn't matter what the data says. The reality no longer matters because they're creating it for themselves. And that's what Festinger found. And this blew my mind this week. It was so fascinating when we think about all of the conspiracy theories that we see in the media right now. When we've seen them now for quite a while. The ones that come to mind immediately, staying away from politics as much as I can, you can go there on your own. QAnon is one. The Flat Earthers, that's another. These folks truly believe what they're saying even though all the data says they're wrong. They are more fervent in their beliefs. They are intractable. You cannot argue with them. You cannot change their mind because they are in cognitive dissonance and they are trying to relieve it and that's how they do it. Now, not everyone does that, but the people who have a belief and they've taken an action, like those who believe that Jesus was coming in 1988 and they sold their farms, they are invested. And they are not going to back down now. They are going to just change the date, right? Now, this is a little bit scary, but let's go back to uh, William Miller and the Miller Lights and the great disappointment that he had. Those folks reorganized. He was brokenhearted. He did not participate, but they reorganized. And today, we call them the Seventh-day Adventists. It's powerful. Cognitive dissonance, this is a powerful thing. Uh, Charles Russell, his followers became the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they go door to door. They're gonna get as many converts as they can. Isn't that what the Christians did in the first century? My son said I shouldn't tell you this or I'll get fired. But I have to say it. Didn't the first century followers of the way, 
the followers of Jesus, didn't they believe that Jesus was going to come back before the end of their generation? Didn't Jesus himself say, before this generation passes away, all these things shall come to pass. You will see it all happen. It's in Mark 13 this afternoon. You're going to want to read it. Jesus was the first date setter, my friends. This is a little bit of discomfort for us, is it not? Jesus, who just said, no one knows the day, went on, according to Mark 13, and set a date before the end of this generation, the Son of Man will return and you will see it. And when he didn't, when that generation began to die, what did they do? They did exactly what Festinger said. They resolved their cognitive dissonance by writing the Gospels down, by collecting the letters of Paul, by sharing their belief, by evangelizing with everyone. Why did they do that? Not because their data was skewed. I believe they did it because they saw the value in the teaching of Jesus and they were willing to say, I think we can live with the mystery of not knowing when. Let's just live with the mystery of we don't understand what happened, that part of what, what Jesus promised us, maybe that was wrong. But Jesus was right about so much, we cannot let this die. They were fully invested in the words and the teaching of Jesus. Now how is that different though than all of these date setters telling us when Jesus is gonna come back? How is Jesus uh, and his setting of a date more acceptable than these other folks? Uh, I won't leave you here. I know it's uncomfortable. This is where I was when I went to bed last night. I was like, oh Lord, you better help me tonight because I don't know how we're gonna end this. We can't stop there, can we? Let's think about this just a little bit differently. There is a difference between setting a date and a prophecy. Setting a date is fortune telling. It's just telling the future. This is going to happen on this day. But prophecy is something different. Prophecy says this is a potential outcome and there are many other outcomes. There are many paths forward. This is a potential one that is dependent on your action. Now let me give you an example of that. Let's go just for a minute here back to the Old Testament book of Jonah. It's a comedy. Jonah is a pretty funny guy. He's given a job to go to a place called Nineveh and tell the people of that town that in three days God's going to come and destroy them all. And Jonah does not want to go because he's afraid that if he tells them that God's going to destroy them in three days, that they are going to change their ways and God is going to show grace. But Jonah eventually goes to Nineveh and tells them all in three days, God is going to level this place. Everybody is going to be dead and the city is going to be destroyed. And then Jonah goes up on a hillside. He's got his big popcorn and his uh, soda in one hand and he sits down to watch the show because he does not like those Ninevites at all and he wants them to be destroyed. So he's excited about that. Three days come and go and God does not show up. There's no destruction. And Jonah is furious. He's so angry because he wanted those terrible people to die. What happened? When the people heard the words of the prophecy, it was one potential future for them. Prophecy holds multiple futures for everyone. When they heard their potential future in three days, they changed immediately. They repented. They took a different action. And God showed mercy and grace. And there was no destruction. Does that mean Jonah was wrong? He set the date in three days. Does that mean God doesn't keep his promises? No, to me it means there's so much hope. 
Just a little bit of good can change the outcome. It can change the future for us, for our lives, for our church, for our community, for this world. The future is many. Prophecy shows us different possible outcomes, and they are all dependent on us. They're dependent on our action. We can change our future. Right now, we could look at our futures and say, well, I can kind of see how this is going to go, right? I'm going to get old and die. <laughs> or the church is going to get old and die. Or everybody's going to get old and die. That doesn't look so great. So let's not think too much about when, because when we think about when, we're missing the opportunity right in front of us now. So if Jesus is prophetic, he gave one potential outcome that this would happen soon. But the people acted. They shared, they loved, they forgave, they repented, they did the work, and God showed grace, and that end did not come. And that does not mean that Jesus set a false date. It just means that prophecy has many sides and many outcomes, and so do we. So let's set a date. I'm so excited about this. I think we should set a date. Let's say, I don't know what sounds good. This is August, end of August. Let's pick June 2024. What kind of future do you want? What do you want? What do you want to see in this place? Let's, let's keep it to church, right? What do you want to see? What do you want to see here? Huh? It works? Oh, she's happy we just have a date. June 2024. All right. You all will prove us right or wrong. It's up to you. What about, um, what about a choir? Can we have a choir here by June 2024? Oh, no takers. Okay. How about we have a picnic in the orchard June 2024? Can we do that? All right. Yes, Caroline. A pianist. We're going to have somebody to play the piano by June 2024. Yes? Yeah, okay, we got, now we got, you people on Zoom, help me here. There's a chat box. Give me some ideas. We're struggling. What else? What can we do? What about a concert in this place? And we open the doors and invite the whole neighborhood. Oh, we have somebody here who's getting, you know, pointed at. June 2024, you're on. What else? Come on, this is prophecy. We have to participate it's not karma. It's not we're on this wheel and all of our bad deeds are going to come back and clobber us. No. Oh, we got something. No, we don't have something. Do we have anything? I see we can have a choir. Somebody said that. Okay. Whoever said yes to a choir, you've got till June. Let's start with live music songs. Some more live music. Some more live music. Okay. And we don't have to wait till June to do it, right? Because that's not going to work. We got to start to do the work in the present moment. Do you folks know how to have fun? Honestly, come on. What else? Something. Give me. It's. I got. Oh no, I'm one minute over. Air conditioning. She wants air conditioning in the community room. You got anything? No. Twenty more people here. Okay, you all better start having children. I don't know how that's going to work. All right, whatever. Hey, it's a God of miracles, right? Get, uh, five more in the to get five more students, uh, tutoring students in the NHL. Yes, yes, that's not the National Hockey League, for those who don't know. Increased church usage. All right, is somebody writing these down? Someone write these down for us. We've got choir, we've got, I said the picnic, we've got live music, we've got piano, we've got tutoring students. Live music, yeah. Well, not just you, Bill. You don't, it's not just you. It can be more than just you. A Pentecostal service. I can do that. We're, we're going to, yeah, I can do that. To have Westminster join us. That's wonderful. What can we do today to open our doors and be welcoming? What can we do? All right. Now you're getting it. It's not about setting the date, but the date is the intention, and it helps us see what our possible futures are. So let's think that way. Let's set, let, it's a date. I will see you in 2024. All right? 
Let's go straight to our sending music because we're running a little bit late.